Hello everyone, uh, welcome to a new um, uh, series of our interviews for citiesabc.com. My name is Denis Guarda and I'm the host of this interview and as well the co-founder of citiesabc.com and the project that we're trying to do to unite cities and thought leaders around the world around the challenges that we're facing in a civilizational moment of uh, urgency and as well a lot of uh, stress, but as well with a lot of opportunities. So citiesabc.com was created precisely to unite different people around the world and creating a bit of a new Magna Carta of ideas for cities using blockchain technology for AR, AI, and a lot of different other technologies. And today we have with us um, someone that I deeply respect, but as well as a fantastic sense of humor and intelligence, Monty Monfort. And um, he is, I think, a person out of the box as a thought leader, um, researcher, journalist. I've been working with Economist, uh, with Forbes, and uh, a lot of other international big media players, but as well right now involved in the crypto and blockchain world, thought leader as well in AI, and as well been a, a citizen of the world, doing a lot of things around different countries, different um, kind of organizations and lifestyles. And this interview will be looking at his career and about his profile, and as well about his new podcast series that we will talk about it. So welcome on board, Monty. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hey, Dennis. Good to see you. Hope you're well. Coping with the uh, new normal. Yes, it's a, a big different normal, let's put it that way. <laughs> a civilizational change of the normal. Um, so, Monty, you have a fantastic profile that goes a bit all over the world and as well a man of ideas, but as well a man of action. Can you bring us a bit of uh, your life story and profile? <laughs> Probably since you were a child, because I think in your case, I think it's interesting. Oh dear. Okay, uh, I was clever when I was 11. Uh, <laughs> there was one school in my area, which was Southwest London, uh, near Hampton, Hampton Court, called Hampton Grammar. So we all tried to get into this school. So eight of us got into the school, uh, and it was a great day. And it was also the first day that I went to Wembley Stadium to see England schoolboys play football. I was like. 10, 11 years old. Uh, so they had very good education, but in the UK educational system, it changed. Uh, when I was about 14 or 15, grammar schools became comprehensive schools or they, be, or, they, or they became independent. And independent meant that anyone that came to the school uh, the following year would have to pay. But the ones who were already at the school, um, we didn't have to pay. So we got uh, the best of education for free. That was a positive side. The negative side was that a lot of people in my year at school after the summer had been talking to their mummy and daddy and they started to behave as if they were better than anybody else. Uh, and I just said, listen, you're the same as me. You were clever when you were 11 and that's it. Don't give me big bullshit, you know what I mean? Uh, so I started to rebel at that time. So I should have gone to Oxbridge. Um, I just... I was a naughty boy. Um, my brain was a little different to theirs. Uh, and then I went and did some very strange things after that. When I was 18, uh, I, I started driving a motorbike around London, delivering parcels when you were paid really good money. Not like Deliveroo today. You were actually paid danger money for what you were doing. Um, and then I worked in a bookmaker's opposite my house. Um, and I got into, into that type of gambling life. Joined William Hill probably about six or seven months later. We used to get two buses to go to Shepherd's Bush, uh, kind of uh, an estate in West London, towards London. Uh, and then in the space of 18 months, I became the manager of that particular shop without any technology or anything, uh, all, all in my brain. I had to you know, settle so many slips, um, not just 10 pounds to win on Dinis to win Smart City Award, it would be a 10 pence each way, Yankee, six doubles, four trebles, one accumulator, eight to one at 50 the odds is eight to five, 10 pence at eight to five is 13, 26p at 11 to 10 is 60, 52. You know, it was a really, really stressful job. And that's actually quite a dangerous shop as well. But I learned a lot of, man a lot of skills in that shop by managing the people, the, the clientele. 
Uh, and then I went to Israel to live on the kibbutz. I'd had enough. A friend of ours had gone over there. Uh, a lot of my friends were kind of working class guys. They, you know, there was a lot of unemployment. Um, I didn't know where I fitted, whether I was a grammar boy or a working class boy or a privileged, intelligent boy. I didn't know what I was. So I wanted to go around the world to find out. I went on a kibbutz in Israel for six or seven months. Um, amazing in time lots of girls etc um and lots of drinking and really really weird jobs with chickens and tractors and stuff uh spent the summer in greece uh came back got on the motorbike delivered some parcels um and then went back on the kibbutz met a girl and this kind of went on for about 10 years you know what i mean i just traveled went to india many times all around the world and as soon as i ran out of money then I'd come back, get on the motorbike, earn some money. So I had no credit card. You know, I went around the world on 200, 200 pounds, basically, the first time. All types of jobs, you know, everywhere. Um, and then, basically, to kind of accelerate this, I retrained as a journalist uh, in 1999. So I was, yeah, so I was 38. So I was quite a, an old guy. Um, and I thought that I'd wasted 20 years of my life, but not really. I'd learned a lot of shit in those times, you know, being on my own and seeing the world for myself. And if there's one thing that's happening at the moment, the fact that I can't see the world at the moment is is the biggest, is the worst thing of all. So I was very lucky at that time. The internet was just beginning. Um, I had an idea of what it was, but also meant it was, it was a great chance for me to catch up. You know, so I did a a three-month course at the London College of Printing, which was legendary. It's a very difficult test to get in. I somehow managed to do so. Um, 75 people a year, three terms, 11 weeks, two weeks, two years' work in 11 weeks, uh, and two weeks you had to get uh, an internship somewhere yourself. You had to, you, to try and get it. Um, and it was for graduates, postgraduates, and I hadn't been to university. Um, and it meant that I would get a diploma or a kind of mini masters in 11 weeks, 13 weeks. Uh, and it meant I kept caught up five years, you know what I mean? In three months. So that was a big thing. Um, and I started working for an IT weekly, tried to understand technology. So I hated technology because I, I, I just didn't want anything to do with it. And then off I went and the last 20 years have been a bit weird. Um, I worked in computing for a year, then I worked for another IT publication, then I went to work in Fleet Street, you know, when the press was at its height as a sub-editor, which was an amazing time. I still love those days. Um, moved down to Brighton, became the website editor of the local newspaper down here. Uh, and then there was a company down here that had just landed the rights to stream the first series of Big Brother, you know. And I knew this was going to be a big deal. So they took me on as their communications director and I had an inside track to the, the forefront of technology. Big Brother, the first series of Big Brother was a big deal, especially in this country where people were watching the internet and not watching TV for the first time. There was one incident when one um, contestant was kicked out. Well, yeah, he was kicked out of the house, but they stopped recording in the house, you know, so people were, you know, trying, what is this? Is it open platform, closed platform? Uh, then I went to work for an incubator, which I suppose is today's equivalent of an accelerator. Uh, and then I got my dad a kid and worked for a games company uh, and realized that the games testing company that I worked for, we needed to do stuff in mobile. Uh, I set up a deal with Vodafone to test every mobile game that went out on Vodafone Live, uh, which was a massive deal at the time. Uh, then went to work for a mobile games publisher in London, but we weren't particularly well funded. We 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 were funded by we were funded because we had the rights, the video rights to the English Premiership outside the UK. The Vodafone had paid a huge amount for it, so this was like 2006, I think. So we had exclusive rights to the Premiership on mobile video in Finland, Holland, Denway. Denmark, sorry, <laughs> Denmark, Norway, the Faroe Islands, and China. 
So it was the wild, wacky West, you know, it was just crazy, crazy, crazy. But then it looked like there was a recession coming. So I went to, took my wife and five-year-old son to India. We lived in Goa on the beach for two years. Uh, we sold the company when I was away uh, for a, not a, a huge amount of money, but okay. I became a Bollywood film star. I was into big Bollywood movies as a really bad British villain with a stupid moustache and a, as a Russian drug dealer, which is a, a long story. Um, I was burnt to death. But I think what I, I learned then, as people are now learning now, is that that was 2008. And I was working remotely from the beach, from an internet cafe, even from my phone sometimes, whether it was in Goa where I lived or in the Himalayas or anywhere, I, I, I could work remotely. It wasn't that difficult. I mean, it wasn't as if I was sitting in my study with my books around me, you know what I mean? It would be a dirty, sweaty mosquito cafe. Um, but that was one thing that I, that I realised that if and when we went back to the UK, I wouldn't be getting the train to London. I wouldn't be living that lifestyle of, of up and down and, you know, not seeing my kid, um, who I'd spent two years in the sea with just about every day. Um, and then from that point, I suppose, I was I had a tough time coming home, I think. You know what I mean? It was difficult to get going again. And my feet were still in the, still in the beach, you know. My feet were still in the sea. But I set up a, a small agency, a PR agency called Mob76, M-O-B-7-6, Monty of Brentford 76, which was my football graffiti when I was a 15-year-old, very childish. Um, uh, and then started to work with some companies, started to also write for The Telegraph, who I used to write for when I was in India. Um, and just build it all up, really. Started collecting. I wrote, I wrote for Wired. I wrote for Newsweek. I was a columnist at The Telegraph for nearly four years. And I was basically, Dennis, just building up my network, you know, to, to, to go higher and higher and higher and, and to test myself against people who were smarter than me. Um, and this went hand in hand for, for a few years until a couple of years ago where I had a good year. I opened up the stock exchange one day, went to Buckingham Palace that evening. Um, all types of invitations to the Houses of Parliament. House. I just got to a point where, you know what, this is, I've, I've gone as far as I can. I'd also started on a speaking career. I'd interviewed Steve Wozniak in Beirut in front of 10,000 people. Did Steve again in Vienna uh, and started to have a career in that respect. And I think it was in October, November of last year, 2019, uh, Kim Kardashian in, in Armenia. And again, I thought, well, if you, she's not only the most famous woman in the world, she was very polite, um, doing some good work. Uh, and by all accounts, whatever you, want, whatever you think of her, she is a female billionaire entrepreneur. You know what I mean? There's, that's, that's the truth. It doesn't matter how she got there or whatever way she did it. She's certainly an amazing entrepreneur. Um, then someone knocked on my door. Did, did I want to come a, become a venture partner in a, in a fund called 7BC, uh, Beyond Continents, uh, 7BC.VC. So that began, began in earnest in October and then started to go to have meetings at the Bank of England. Uh, and all that stuff. I was still keeping the agency going because I still need to pay the school fees and the money. Uh, and then, unlike the financial crisis in 2008, which I saw coming, this pandemic I didn't see coming. Completely off guard. Really bad timing to join a VC, you know, just when a pandemic hits the, hits the earth or hits the planet. Um, so we have to be a bit agile. You know, I lost probably some some serious money in consultancy fees that were agreed for 2020, uh, which is, you know, a, a setback, but hopefully just a setback. Uh, but I think the brain that I had when I was 11 years old, uh, which wasn't really catered for by my education because I was quite creative, this type of situation is very good for someone like me because I'm used to thinking of my feet. I self-isolated in India for two years during the financial crisis. I've, I don't go to London. I, you know, I live in the Sussex Downs in the countryside. I'm quite happy on my own. 
as you can see, I, I, I love reading, you know, and learning and knowledge, and I'm, and I'm very happy to do that by myself. Um, but it, it's a bit of a strange time, so we set up this podcast, maybe similar to what you're doing, Dennis. We'd love to have you on our show, by the way. Um, we call it Block Speak, as in BS, bullshit, ha, 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 um, which is a, you know, leading characters in the blockchain and the crypto space. I mean, I, I had some interest in... Crypto I had some money stolen last year, about $30,000. So I know quite a lot about it. I've written about it for the BBC. Interviewed many people in this space, you know, on stage and all that stuff. I'm very interested in blockchain. Oh. The economist says uh, you, can, you can only use the blockchain when it comes to Bitcoin. Any other time it's blockchain. So there's something maybe now that you didn't know that, you know now that you didn't know before so that's it really you know block speak we had john mcafee on last week who's completely insane uh, and told us everything about his new coin to how he got managed to escape the dominican republic last year by feigning a heart attack so what you should do if you're a cocaine dealer in south america so so we try and make it a bit fun you know so it is bs bullshit but it's blockspeak.io if anyone's interested um, we've got some great guests coming on uh, and we're doing this I'm doing this in my study you know it's this you just have to adapt I think that's a fantastic uh, adventure and I'm sure that you're going to write a novel I told you already and I think you you are like a modern Alan Ginsberg because you have the ideas the the, the adventure side but as well the intellectual part but of, of course with the media and the technology side even if you don't didn't like technology you know enough about it so Speaking on that, and I think, uh, I think uh, at the moments we are, and as, as well, how do you see the I think having someone with so much different? Um, I think uh, first of all, life experience, because most of the people don't live that in three lives, and I think you've been going for a lot of different countries, and you saw as well the progress that we had in the world. So, <clears throat> let's say from the first time that probably you went to Israel for the kebab and all the different things you've been doing in terms of the different areas and different countries. There was a big change in the world. And you mentioned the last financial crisis of 2008, but as well, previous to that, your first experience traveling around the world with 200 pounds. And that as well, we've been seeing a, a massive globalization and a massive transformation of the world. But in the end of the day, we are still here and we're still in a massive crisis that in the space of one month, we mostly broke everything that we know in terms of financial and, and economic um, comfort that we had in the last 100 years. So how do you see this moment as a thought leader, as an adventurer, and as well someone that is looking at more than just the surface? Because I think that this is probably, and as a, someone that loves books, history tells us a lot of things, but it continues repeating in different ways. So I want to ask you as an intellectual, how do you see this moment, and especially someone that's been going through different, a lot of different scenarios. And of course, the world in 20 years passed from a total globalization, total digitalization, or at least not total, but a, a big part of digitalization. But it's still, we have all these problems. So I want to just kind of a no, macro picture. How do you see this? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's, made, it's the happiest day of my life. Someone's finally called me an intellectual. I don't need anything else in life. Thank you for that, uh, Dennis. A thought leader, I think, is pushing it. I don't believe that I'm a thought leader. I have thoughts, but I'm not an early adopter. Right? I'm a kind of a lunchtime adopter. You know, I don't get up early to think about these things. I let it, you know, try and try and try and incubate inside me about how things how things are going, and obviously keep on reading uh, and make sure that my sources are impeccable. So the whole, as I was saying in my slightly rambling speech earlier. That I wanted access to the to the smartest people, uh, and I know them, and they're my friends now. So that's where I go to for for information. So they're smarter than me, uh, and I just kind of filter that to to my audience or my social media audience or or my blog or or, or whatever. Um, I, I I'm a warrior in life. I worry, you know. I've got a son who was 17 on Monday. Last year it was a helicopter and, you know, lunch and everything. And this year it was, you know, a couple of balloons. So anything can happen. So I think that this, there was a decision made 
to save the lives of people as opposed to risk the lives of of many. So we, you know, we decided to look after the old, but the argument is, are we penalizing the young for looking after the old? If I was a young person, I would be pretty pissed off with my generation. I think we're, I'm a boomer, I think, you know, okay, boomer. And as my son says, Corona is a boomer remover. <laughs> it's getting rid of all the old people, hopefully. Uh, but I think we're seeing that that's not necessarily the case. And it's, you know, we, we have a prime minister who's in intensive care. You know, it's not someone I agree with politically, but it just shows you that it's indiscriminate. It could be anybody, you, you know what I mean? So we're thinking about this, but I'm worrying about the future. I'm worrying about after this and what it means for the economies of the world. This isn't going to go away just because it peaked in Italy or it peaked in Wuhan. It's going to peak in London, then it'll come to where I live and it'll peak, but it'll just keep on waving through. I mean, I think there were 60 million deaths in the Spanish flu epidemic, was it 2019, I think. Um, 60 million died and 30 million of those were in India. And I know India and I know India that you are never alone in India. Wherever you are, if you're having a piss behind a tree or you're on a beach, there's always someone within two meters of you at any time and that was 10 years ago and there's probably another 200 million people in india than there are now so if that epidemic or that pandemic is going on anywhere on the planet it's going to affect us you know us in the west us 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 being a, a species really and you can see what we've done to the planet right you know what i mean like nature is is nature is above everything you know nature to me is i suppose god I, I don't know if i believe in god but i believe in nature um and what we've done to the planet and how we've abused our position nature i think as it's done many times before it said right you're taking the piss right we're going to put you in detention like a school we're going to put you in detention for three months and when we let you out and you carry on behaving the way you were, we're just going to get rid of you. You're a virus, humanity. We're just going to get rid of you. If we come out of those three months wiser, less busy, less crazy, less selfish, less consumerist, this might be a good thing. You know, th there's some data that whatever you believe on the figures in China, three to 5,000 dead. I mean, there, are, there, there is data saying that it saved the lives of 100,000 people because the air quality has got so much better. So in, in a way, it's, I know it sounds terrible for families that are suffering, but if you look at the macro picture, I mean, I've got a view outside my window where I can hear the birds. I haven't heard the birds for years, you know, all, I, all I've heard is cars. This is weird. This experience now reminds me of when I was a kid, you know, 50 years ago, when there weren't so many cars, when there wasn't so much noise, when there wasn't so much light. You know, I, I took my dog, I'm allowed out once a day, right? I Sometimes I do it in the morning, sometimes I do it at lunchtime, um, take the dog for a walk. But there was a full moon here two nights ago, and it was beautiful just to walk under a full moon you know just for 45 minutes and, and and just feel part of nature again you know this is one of the reasons i went traveling was to have that feeling so i'm very worried about things economically obviously in the vc space i get a lot of information about a gdp downturn of 20 percent this year i think that's i think it could be more than that but that is the that would be more than the cumulative effect of the mobilization for two world wars and the Great Depression all ro rolled into one. And we talked earlier about blockchain and crypto. Uh, this could be the time for digital currency to, to, to come forward. Basically, well, what's happened is, is that we've all become digital in the space of a month. What I thought would take maybe three or four years that we would just be doing this conversation that we're having here. There's a, there's a book on the shelf somewhere written by, I think, E.M. Forster in 1915, I think. I'll, I'll, sorry, I can't remember the name of the book. 
um, about people living all around the world, not seeing each other and having conversations, sort of video call or whatever. So we've been pushed in, pushed into, accelerated into a digital corner. It's almost like a singularity in the last month. that We've been pushed at super record speed into dealing with each other in a, in a different way. Who, who would have told you that six weeks ago you go for a walk in the countryside and you give someone distance and you both go on to different sides and you, you don't talk. You almost like hate each other or you talk too much. And you go, oh, this is a bit weird, isn't it? Ha, 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 yeah, yeah, you know. We're very quick to change our behaviour, you know, and I think we will be very quick to change it back. If you, if you want this lockdown to go on, go out. If you want this lockdown to carry on, take the piss, be clever, do what you want, you know, but if you want it to, 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 to stop, then you have to follow the rules. And I'm an anarchist, man. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I don't know, I'm a bit of a wanker in many respects, but I am my own man and I, I really believe in freedom and all that stuff. I mean, I took my dog for a walk this morning and I was just sitting in the car afterwards, you know, reading a book on physics and the cop car came next to me. Where'd you come from? Where'd you live? If that had happened to me any time in my life, it'd have been fuck off. I do what I like. You know what I mean? Now it's like, yeah, sorry, man. I'm just taking a dog for a walk. I live very close by. Um, just reading this book. What should I do, sir? You know what I mean? So, so, so we're all, we all have to be in this together, really together, you know, and it doesn't matter. You see this perfect storm of populist right wing leaders. The 2008, uh, financial crash was saved by by a, a British guy called Gordon Brown in, in, of the Labour Party. You know what I mean? He was one of the he was on the radio the other day, a voice of reason. And a lot of previous pandemics or potential pandemics have stopped because of global global cooperation. Now you've got China saying it wasn't me. Now you've got an utter lunatic believing he's the Messiah by advertising drugs that are not miracle cures just because he's looking for a place in history. Um, so you don't have any cooperation. Everyone is like, oh, America's first, America's first, or UK first, or China first. Well, it's about being a species, about humanity. If you want to be like that, you're just going to fuck it up. You're just going to get exterminated. And, and we have to really do it together. You, you, you know your world. You're an amazing poet and you've got a great network. The way that scientists and big data, what's the word, analysts, you know, the, 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 how they work together, right? That's global. That's intelligent. That's smart. But when it comes to politics, when people are trying to score points, different countries have got, oh, it's almost like the Olymp Olympics has been cancelled. And now we have the Health Olympics for 2020. Who can get to the curve first? Who can be underneath that? Who did it better? Was it the South Koreans? Was it the Germans? Were the Americans completely stupid? I, I read today that a pastor in, in America saying that it's okay to go to church. And if you get corona at church and you die, then it's a good thing that you went to church. Are you mad? You know what I mean? You just need to have people with, you know, still, still quiet, intelligent brains to say, hang on. Let's just think about this, you know. It's not just about flattening the curve. It's about what happens to the, the economies of the world for the next generation. You know, if you've got $2 trillion pumped into the US and people making up money overnight that doesn't seem to have any value, why not put your money into Bitcoin? Why not have digital currencies or even national digital currencies? You know, people people aren't going to be able to go out as much as they did for years. You know what I mean? You're probably going to have to have a bracelet or something on your phone that says, that, you know, you've had it, you're fine, off you go, you know. And when it comes to health and privacy, I think it's been clearly shown over the last, over the last, I don't know, last month, that people prefer their health over privacy. Can I get it? Can I come out of my house, please? I lose all my privacy because I get stamps like some concentration victim. And that's not belittling the Holocaust in any means. Sorry, that's a really bad way to, to, to say it. But I think the import 
is that of that strength is that if you want to go out of the world or to go out of your prison, you're going to have to have something on your phone or on your wrist to say that you can go out. For those people that don't have that, they won't be able to have as much freedom as, as other people. So then you've got another form of inequality. You know, If I've had the virus and I'm tested, I can walk out into that world like a zombie and take over the world and do what I want, anything I want, because I'm not going to infect anyone I'm not going to be infected, and I can prove it. You know what I mean? Those type of people, it's not all of those people will be good people, you know? And if you've got someone walking around who's a bad person, I don't know. As I said, I, I worry. I completely. So on the, the areas of uh, specialty about your podcast, the blog speak, how do you see the blockchain um, right now in this time? And what can we do and how you see the, the things we can do actually right now to, to make sure that a lot of the disruption that we're seeing as well, the, this topic that we think can actually be tackled? Well, I'm a massive believer in blockchain, right? Because I think the internet's infected. Uh, I think there's too many bad, uh, bad actors. I think people that can work out how you key into your computer or can steal things without you even realizing it. I might be, I mean, we we're using zoom. Zoom is probably one of the worst technologies to steal your data. Look, I don't care. I'm talking to you, but it's not a good, it's not a good thing. You know, there are other, other similar types of products that, that are, with more of a security aspect that you should be looking at than zoom. We're, we're actually, the architect of our own grave digging by using Zoom. You know, we're asking for it, right? Blockchain has been hyped, and I've spoken about it at events from Nicosia to Houston to Malta to all over the place. And, and, and that's why I don't consider myself a thought leader because I moderate people and I've, I've done a lot of these, these type of events. Um, so I know a lot about blockchain. I know a lot about the hype of blockchain. Um, but I also believe that there are certain sectors where it is making a difference. I think in the blockchain for good area, I think it, it gets rid of a lot of waste, especially when it comes to so-called aid and charities in Africa, where lots of the money's going to the, into the wrong pockets. You know, proof of concept there. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer. You know what I mean? And I think it it might become... What people don't realise about blockchain or the, the blockchain that, was, that Bitcoin is based on, everyone hears the stories about people being hacked and exchanges. Blockchain's never been hacked, ever. You know, it is completely secure. Um, so I think that blockchain for good, you know, where you can source... If you're using your laptop or you're driving your electric car... If you're a nice human, you want to know where all the minerals came from. You know, you, I've got nothing. I've no idea where this laptop, what, where this, I've got no idea what's in this laptop and where it came from. But if you think about, you know, an electric, electric cars, you're going to need more lithium. Lithium for batteries is in Congo. I don't want to be responsible for buying a product that makes a 12 year old boy or girl go down a mine. So certain aspects of that, Ford have been doing this uh, because Ford, you, just, you wouldn't expect Ford to be doing something like this, but obviously they needed lithium for their iron batteries. So, so there's a lot of upbeat there. My only problem, the only problem I think now is that because we're all disorientated by what's happening to us and, you know, hoping that we're not going to get ill and hoping that our friends and families are not going to get ill, although they will, um, is that technologies that are good for the world, such as blockchain, may be overlooked because everyone is so worried about how they're going to feed their kids, what they're going to do. I mean, this in this country, um, we've had Brexit and we've had all of this ridiculous decision to leave Europe. Um, and everyone's, you know, lots of people have gone home, especially because of, you know, the pandemic. So, our whole agricultural fruit picking sector uh, is basically picked by a lots of Eastern European workers, right? They're the ones that, that, that pick the food for us to eat. It's a, 
it's, it's dis disgraceful that that should be the case. But now there's no one to pick the fruit, right? Because the workers have all gone home. But now there are lots of workers that don't have jobs. So I think there was some data I read this morning that there has been a 338% increase of people trying to get jobs on farms. You know what I mean? Because A, they're either been furloughed, I think you can work if you're furloughed, or they're worried about getting money. And where else can you work? You know, you can work in a supermarket or, I mean, you know, you can you can be a driver or, or you know, at the moment, and who knows how long this will go. Social distancing on a beautiful English day, picking apples. I mean, come on, I did that in Israel, you know, in 1983. It was wonderful. It was a great way to live. So maybe we're just going back to where we were. We're just being reminded that it's not about get, jumping on the packed train next to someone you've never met or, or spending all this ridiculous money to, to have a really ridiculous situation. It might be, do you know what? What do you need? Do you need trainers? No, you don't need trainers. What do you need? You need a couple of T-shirts, a couple of pairs of jeans, a jacket to be able to keep warm or to keep cool. You need to exercise your body. You don't, you don't need pilates, pilates or yoga. You can just walk up and down and pick cherries. Walk up and down and, and then make friends. You know what I mean? After you pick some apples and have some cider at the end of the day, then walk, walk home as the sun comes down. Like all the great books by Thomas Hardy or Laurie Lee or Cider with Rosie. You know, maybe there's, maybe it's just a, a realignment of stuff that we went too far, you know. I'd, I'd be interested in this and what you think is going to happen to smart cities. I mean, is it going to be, are they going to turn into dumb cities? What are we going to do? Uh, in one end, I think, uh, <clears throat> picking in some of the things you said, but I think smart cities are going to become more important than ever because we're going to have, <clears throat> as our civilization, like as you put it very well, it's going through a huge questioning. We'll need to organize ourselves more around cities because we are all in cities, whatever is a small or a big one. And, and of course, the only way to organize ourselves around the cities is having more data. So I think the smart cities technology are going to be increasingly more important. <clears throat> but of course, I think the point right now is what velocities you're going to have. Because of course, the smart city only works well if there's enough innovation, but as well enough data to create insights. And, and of course, to run that, you need a huge amount of development and innovation that we don't have in most of the cases, and only a few cases. But I think it's not going to stop, but of course, I think the point is the privacy and the relationship between privacy and autonomy. And I think that's uh, probably my last question for you and, and picking, we are close to one hour. So um, how do you see precisely your thought leadership and especially the work you're doing with the uh, with, uh, blog speak on this area? You, you are interviewing some world uh, disruptors and, and a lot of high profile people. How do you see and what's your goal with your podcast and the work you do right now? Because I think that's the most important. I think you, you, you highlight one very important thing, the sense of adventure, the sense of having a, a place that is not about the, the sneakers or the, the consume, but about identity, about these things. And I think probably your podcast is a good way and you are as well an authentic adventure in the right way. Uh, well, thank, thank you very much. I mean, BlockSpeak was based on, on blockchain to begin with, but really it's just an excuse for me to, uh, to, to interview in an authentic way uh, people that are connected to change, you know, not just in blockchain. It's, it starts off like that because it gets people interested because it has, a, it has a theme, I suppose. But the idea really is to get people out of their comfort zones. Like, I mean, we're having a great chat, Dennis, right? We know each other. We we wore the same clothes a few months ago, right? Yes. <laughs> when we met at my club. Oh, I missed that club, I swear. Um, that's the biggest star. Oh, my God, London. <laughs> um, uh, the idea was just to get people talking in an authentic way, right? In the, in the way that I have my impeccable sources, the way that I get my information. There's no such thing as false, fake news in my, in my life, you know. And there shouldn't be fake news in anybody's life. So the idea of block speak is just to get people talking, you know, and for me to just lay myself out in front of them and say, listen, what do you think? You know, and at this time when people are looking for 
authentic sources about what's happened because they're scared and they don't know what's going to happen. We'll, we'll be talking to, you know, economists such as yourself, um, disruptors, failures, maybe. Hope, I really hope to talk to some people I don't like, the people that have made uh, capital out of this situation, profiteers, companies that have treated their employees really badly. I hope to get to speak to some of those people and see if they've got the balls to tell our audience, you know, what, what, why they made this decision. And I think this is basically what, what we want, isn't it? At the end of this three or four months, we want the world to be a better place, you know? So we need to question not only the people that are making it a better place and what they want to do, but also what the bad people have done and how sorry they are for what they've done or whether they're going to have to pay for it or whether they're going to transform themselves into the new world. So that's the idea of, of uh, it's just a conversation. It'll probably be once or twice a week. There was a huge milestone last uh, last night with my two co-founders. We got our deck. We got a, we got our first media deck and sponsorship uh, thing. And a lot, we've had a load of inquiries um, about sponsoring it. And the idea is not really to turn. Well, I think you have to turn a profit, right? Do you know what I mean? But it'd be really good if we can get some money there and put it in the right places, you know, and try and get as many people on there as possible. But I, but I do emphasise, I don't want this to be kind of Plato's cave where I just invite people who are good and who I consider to be on the same level as myself. I want to talk to some bad people as well uh, because there's nothing more challenging when you think of someone that you disagree with and then they make a case for why they think the way they do. That's another challenge for me is to say, right, well, okay, let me get my views here that I thought you were an idiot and maybe you're not the idiot I thought you were. You know, it's, 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 basically, it's basically like a really shit TV show and I'm a really bad TV host. That's about it. <laughs> oh, very good. So, Monte, thank you so much. So, I think, where can you tell us where people can find you? And I think um, for someone that doesn't know, hey guys. we're going to put that. Michael, we're finishing an interview. Give us some minutes. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, yeah so it's blockspeak.io. Uh, block, as in block of uh, chain, blockchain, and speak. Block, block Jesus. <laughs> Blew it. Blockspeak.io, where their pre free previous interviews are on there. Uh, Blockspeak's on all social channels. My name is Monty Munford, M-U-N, Munford. It's quite easy to find. There's only one person named like that in the world. Uh, pretty active on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, uh, and Twitter, especially uh, a blog, mob76outlook.com, although that might be changing. Uh, venture partner 7bc.vc but I think for the foreseeable future for the next couple of months a lot of my energy is going to be you know focused on block speak and I'm looking forward to uh, questioning you like you've questioned me thank you so much and uh, pleasure and uh, well keep safe over there <laughs> <laughs>